So um, today I'm going to talk about uh, the proposed DSM-5 criteria. Um, and I first need to say that I am in conflict of interest in the sense that I do get royalties, <coughs> excuse me, from diagnostic instruments that aren't specifically related to these criteria, but do are, are things that we have used in trying to anticipate the criteria. Um, the royalties that I get from projects I'm involved in or clinics are donated to uh, some autism foundations, though. So. And then I want to say that this is not my criteria. I mean, I am one of a group of somewhat of a changing group of about 15 people. Sue Suido is the chair of this committee, and you'll see that there are people from many different disciplines. You know, there's a cadre of child psychiatrists, because this is for child psychiatry, but also psychologists, speech and language pathologists, education people, developmental people, uh, neuropsych ed people. Okay. Um, and then just to sort of uh, walk you through what I'm going to do, I'm going to talk about general issues in diagnosis, and then talk about specific changes in the criteria for autism spectrum disorders, talk very briefly about a new communication disorder diagnosis, um, then talk about the idea of specifiers. So you'll hear about this as we go along, and the notion of assessing overall impairment, both of which are things that are hold true for all DSM-5 diagnoses, not just um, neurodevelopmental disorders, and then end, if we have time, with general comments. And then I just wanted to start with a video, because you all got up so early in the morning <laughs> to come to this. I thought we should have something a little more interesting than me <laughs> to start out with. So this is just a video. This is a boy in Amy Weatherby's early intervention treatment. Um, can you start the video? And I think he's a good idea of what many people's conceptions of autism are. Okay. Can you play? <laughs> What I wanted you to see here is, first of all, to remind us that we are talking about real children and people when we get into these criteria. It's very easy for them to start feeling very mathematical and, pu you know, public relations, but we're talking about how do you describe this little boy. And in fact, this isn't very diagnostic. What we see is a little boy who does not want his hands and face washed and whose mother is going about it as fast as she possibly can, things that are not unique to autism. On the other hand, he's not communicating very well. Neither of them is communicating very well. And he doesn't have a good way to let her know what to do. And she's assuming that he doesn't know what she wants him to do. Then this is a video about a year later of the same boy. Whoops. OK. Hey. Hey, what you want? Hey, show me your nose. Show me your nose. Hot. 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 Yeah, hot. Turn it off. Okay, alright. Hot. Turn it hot. Hot. Turn it off. You want me to turn it on? Turn it on. Uh -huh. okay. I don't Yeah. Yeah. What? Brush your teeth? Brush your teeth. <laughs> okay. 
Nosti. 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 All I wanted to do here was for you to see that a year later, with help to his mother about how to set things up and other kinds of intervention, he can communicate much better. He, he's obviously much happier in this situation. Um, he still has autism, which I don't know that you've diagnosed from this, but he has changed a lot. And he's only changing from an 18-month-old to a two and a half year old, what about changing from 18 months to age five, 10, 14, you know, 50? And th that is our um, challenge in coming up with diagnostic criteria. So what I want to do is head into where are we now and where do we need to be? Theoretically, a diagnosis should give us information about a lot of different uh, facts. Uh, one of them is etiology, and I found myself putting little stars on these and then getting a little obsessed. This is the contagion of autism of how many stars each thing should have. <laughs> but we, um, we certainly know that there is a strong genetic component in autism, and we don't know what accounts for variability even when genetics is constant, for example, within identical twins. So we're one big step toward an answer, but we have far, far to go in terms of etiologies. We know a lot about the course of autism, um, but the trouble is the course is changing with early intervention, and this, that is also true for prognosis. So we can predict in, in many ways gradual steps that individual children will take, but endpoints we're not very good at, except to know that right now, most individuals who have autism when they're very small still have something like autism when they're adults. But that's about the level, but the little steps we can do. Appropriate treatments, we know a lot about behavioral and more relationship-based interventions, but we don't really know how much we should do, what are the immediate goals, how, um, what are the endpoints, um, and, and we don't know very much at all about psychopharmacological treatment. And last, probably the thing that we know the most about is risk for other things. We know that there are risks for autism in families that have one child with autism. We know that other siblings may have other milder problems. Um, we know that there are different rates in seizures. So there is meaning to this diagnosis, um, but it has a long way to go. Right, sorry. Right now, I think we're actually at a good point in diagnosis, so I hope that DSM-5 doesn't cause us to be at a less good point. We right now have worldwide standard criteria for diagnosis because DSM-4 is very similar to ICD-10. And this really was due to the di di diplomatic efforts of Fred Volkmar and Mike Rudder to work this out. This time we're doing the reverse. We have DSM-5 coming along and then ICD-11. And so who knows? what's going to happen. But it's been very useful just talking to this whole group that we all have very similar criteria. We're not broken up by North America versus Europe versus Asia. Um, we also know that with combinations of history, so getting information from parents or teachers, and direct observation, we can make very accurate diagnoses of autism in preschool and school-age children. We're not very good if we just use one source of information, but if we use two sources of information, not necessarily tied to specific instruments, but you have to talk to the parents, and someone who knows what autism is needs to see the child. When you put that together, we can come up with very stable diagnoses. Um, and the good news is that we can do this with children who are quite young. We're trying to push that younger, and I think you heard many talks over the last couple days about how to do that. We also know that within a clinic, clinicians' estimates of how severe autism is, or distinctions between Asperger's, autism, PDD, and OS, improve accuracy beyond the standard tests. 
So within a particular clinic. Okay. Um, and right now we're working from a diagnosis that is based on three domains. So social impairment, communication, including speech. So the absence of speech is a major feature in the current diagnosis and repetitive behaviors. And that this is what defines autism. We then have PDD, which is a bigger circle and allows you to omit one of these. And then we have Asperger syndrome, which is, again, a bigger, a, well, a smaller circle and, and means that you cannot have these things. Um, in addition, the landscape of diagnosis has changed. We're having many more referrals of very young kids. And some of the criteria that we have are really intended for kids who are in school or expected to be to have many more relationships than a toddler. We also are having many more referrals of children without intellectual disabilities. And the good news is not having intellectual disabilities gives you many more ways to compensate or work around your problems or learn alternative routes to behaving. So those kids are much more difficult to diagnose. We also have more adolescents and adults, often who have other psychiatric conditions. I mean, in our clinic last week, we had six referrals, self-referrals of adults, um, who all thought maybe they had autism or Asperger syndrome. Now, from our data, maybe one of them will, um, but and that's really important, but five of them will have other things that are out of our expertise. We're seeing the effects of early intervention, so that that's going to affect some of the primary factors in diagnosis. For example, um, those of you who use the ADI know that we ask all those questions about the child between four and five years of age, because we assume that is the most clear period of autism. But if you have a child who is diagnosed at two, put in early intervention, especially a child without intellectual disabilities, four to five may not be the most clear period. They may already be moving out to some degree or really shifting. And so we have to take that into account. And we have less association with intellectual disability, but we still need to figure out how to diagnose autism or what is the relevance of diagnosing autism in children who are very severely handicapped. 